Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So great to hear from Pastor Andrew and Pastor Stetson about what's happening with our brand new campus in North Aurora. And I do hope you'll continue to pray for and celebrate with us this great opportunity that Chapel Street has to make an impact in that community. Well, way back in the fall of 1974, right about the same time I went away for college, my family moved from a small town in New York uh, that had been my hometown for some nine years to Orlando, Florida, where my dad had taken a brand new job as pastor. So the following spring, at the end of my freshman year of school, I went home, but home was no longer in New York. Home was now in Florida. So then I talked my parents into allowing me to take uh, my two younger brothers uh, on a road trip all the way back to New York so we could visit our old stomping grounds and our old friends. It was over a thousand miles one way. I was 18 years old. My brothers were 16 and seven. What could possibly go wrong? Well, I found out. We got to New York fine, but on the way back, I was driving uh, through Georgia on, the, on our way back to Florida at about 2 a.m. in the morning when my brothers were asleep in the back seat and I got pulled over by a Georgia state trooper for going 79 in a 55 miles an hour zone. Now the tro trooper rightfully gave me a ticket uh, and when I didn't have the cash to pay the ticket right there on the road, he told me I had to follow him to the local sheriff's office, which was in a small town in Georgia. Now I want you to Picture the scene. Uh, remember the sheriff's office in Andy Griffith's show? Uh, well, that was the scene in Georgia. The sheriff was a large man sitting behind a desk, and I could see, actually see the jail cell behind him where I was afraid I was going to end up. And he looked at me. He looked at my younger brothers who were just frightened to death, and he said, hmm, 79 and a 55. You're in a heap of trouble, son. He said, whose car are you driving? And I said, that's my dad's car. He said, does he know you have his car? I think he thought we were uh, run away, runaways or joyriding or something. I said, yes, sir. And he said, why don't we give him a call just to be sure? And he made me call my dad at 2 a.m. to tell him I had gotten a speeding ticket for going 79 and a 55 in Georgia. And that was not a call I wanted to make. Well, my dad answered. I did the best I could to explain what had happened. And he only said, are you and your brothers okay? I said, yeah, we're fine. He said, give the phone back to the sheriff, which I did. And from then on, I could only hear the sheriff's side of the conversation. He said, yes, sir, that's right, 79 and a 55, $100, sir. And then there was a pause, and he said, yes, sir, I'll send them on their way. He looked down and said, you can go now, son, better slow down. Turns out my dad had paid the ticket, and I was free to go. I learned a lot of things about authority in that little story, which I'll come back to a little bit later. We're in a series now that's going to last us most of this year called Following the King from the Gospel According to Mark. And last week, Pastor Jeff began the series by saying, the question is not what we make of the Gospel of Mark. The question is what the Gospel of Mark makes of us. And this is why we made these little Gospel of Mark journals for you to use and follow along with us. You can mark them up. You can circle important phrases. You can make notes. And I would actually encourage you to try to read ahead a week or two in the series so that you can ask your questions and mark your notes. And then uh, when we preach on it, you can then fill in and learn uh, where you might have questions. So make sure you pick one of these up at any of our campuses and you can use them for your own study. Jeff said the Gospel of Mark is answering two main questions. First, who is Jesus? In the very first verse of chapter 1, Mark writes, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So who is Jesus? He is the Christ, which is a word that simply means anointed one or king, and he is the Son of God. Mark says he's the beginning of the gospel. That is the good news of God's salvation that has now come through his Son, the King. And what did Jesus come to do? In verse 14 of chapter 1, we read, Now after John, that's the baptizer, was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. 
Jesus came to proclaim, to announce the arrival of the kingdom of God through himself, in himself, because he is the good news of God. In chapter 1, Mark goes on to tell us that Jesus the King came teaching and healing with authority. Remember verse 27 from last week. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And the second question, Jeff said, is what does it mean to follow Jesus as our king? Verse 17 of chapter 1, Jesus says, he said to them, follow me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jeff said three things last week. When Jesus speaks, things happen. When Jesus speaks, ordinary people follow him. And when Jesus speaks, broken people are made whole and troubled people are set free. Now, Mark ends chapter 1 by telling us Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to hear him from every quarter. Our text for today uh, is in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. So let's dive in. Mark 2, verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Now, let me give you just a little bit of background on Capernaum. Capernaum was located at the north end of the Sea of Galilee. You can see it right up here. It's about 20 miles north of Nazareth, where uh, Jesus grew up, and it's about uh, 70 or 80 miles north of Jerusalem down here. And Capernaum was actually the hometown where uh, several of the earlier disciples uh, lived and where they grew up. It's where uh, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew were from, or James and his brother John were from, and it became kind of the home base for Jesus' ministry in this whole area of Galilee. And now we'll just continue in verse 2. Uh, and many were gathered there so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could no longer get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith... He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. I'm going to circle this because I want you to remember this phrase. Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes, and the scribe was a, were, scribes were religious figures who were highly educated, and they interpreted and wrote out the law and made commentary on it. So religious uh, men were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Okay, my guess is this is a fairly well-known story to you. Uh, you may have first heard it in Sunday school when you were a child. And we tend to remember this story for two main reasons. First, a paralyzed man is dropped through a hole in the roof. I mean, it's a very dramatic scene. And secondly, this paralyzed man is healed. He gets up and walks because Jesus healed him. It's a miracle story. Now, those are two very significant points uh, in this story. But if that's all we know of this story, then I think we kind of miss the point. I'm going to try to explain that today. Today, I want to look at this story as a story that revolves around four problems. First, we see what I'm calling the problem of faith. The problem of faith. Uh, back in the summer of 1984, 
I uh, led a, helped lead a Christian basketball team on a tour of Bolivia and South America. And I've told stories about this experience in the past. We spent five weeks or so crisscrossing the country, large cities and small villages, playing games against local teams and sharing the gospel in whatever way we could and encouraging local churches. One of the cities we visited was called Cochabamba, a relatively small city up in the mountains and very difficult to get to by road. Uh, the local uh, basketball team there was very popular, and we uh, learned when we got there that we were the first, very first North American team to ever come to the town of Cochabamba. And on top of that, their local squad was undefeated in their home town for like 20 years, something like that. And word got out that we had arrived. There were little articles in the local newspaper and quite a buzz happened. I mean, they were treating us like we were the Boston Celtics or something, which we were not. Uh, but on the night of the game, the arena was just packed. A small arena, maybe 2,000 people, but just packed all the way up to the top. In fact, as we warmed up, we saw people breaking windows in the top of this arena, climbing through the windows, sitting on the rafters above the court. They were so desperate to get in to see that game. And by the way, uh, we won that game at the end. But look here in, Mar in chapter 2, verse 2. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. So before we even get to the problem of faith, we see the problem of a crowd. So a crowd descends on the house where Jesus is teaching. He's become very popular. There's no more room, no way to get in. Now, we don't know for sure, but there's a possibility that this story takes place actually in Peter's own home because it was sort of the home base for the ministry of that region. And if you travel today to the site of ancient Capernaum, you can actually see the excavated foundations of what many archaeologists believe to be the foundations of Peter's home in Capernaum. You can see it a little bit here, although it's a little hard to tell. The next slide is, a, is a, an artist's rendering of what that compound might have looked like at that time. Now in the day, houses were constructed very simply, one story uh, out of stone walls, small courtyards uh, with maybe roofs made of tree branches and straw and maybe, uh, maybe a few tiles. They weren't large, so even 20 or 30 people would have made a, a really crowded situation at that home. Now we look at verse 3, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Now, here's the problem. A paralytic is brought before Jesus. Now, the word uh, that Mark uses here refers to a whole variety of, of physically debilitating ailments. We don't know the exact medical diagnosis this man was, was experiencing or how he became paralyzed. We only know that he has a very real physical problem. But we also see this man had four friends, four nameless men recorded in the gospel who also have a problem, and they have the problem I'm calling the problem of faith. They know two things, just two things. They know something about Jesus. Uh, they know he's teaching with authority. They know he's been able, by that authority, to heal certain illnesses. And they also know something about the condition of their friend. They know their friend is both helpless and hopeless. They believe Jesus might be able to help their friend, but they can't get to him because of the crowd. So what do they do? Do they get discouraged? Uh, do they just go away and wait for a more convenient time? No. Here's what they do. Verse 4. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now, they do the totally reasonable thing to climb up on top of a stranger's home, tear a hole in the roof, and drop the man down. Now, due to the simple construction of the day, it would be a bit easier then to do this than in one of our homes today. But still, they had to drag a full-grown man up a stairway, get him onto the roof, and make a hole big enough to drop him down. This is what I'm calling the problem of faith. Every human being, I believe, shares the problem of faith. Because every human being must in some way or another answer two questions. In what or who do we place our faith? In what or who do we place our faith? In God, in our health, in our wealth, uh, in our politics, in ourselves? We all face that question. Secondly, 
we ask, and what does faith look like? What is faith? What does it look like? Clearly, these four men answered the first question. Their faith was in Jesus. They believed he could help their friend. And now, what did their faith look like? I think it looked a lot like love. We see their love and compassion for their friend. Let me pause here for a moment. What if I ask the question, how many of you watching this today could say that you came to faith in Jesus because you had a friend who helped you see him. You had a friend who helped you come to him. I think many of us would raise our hands. Very few of us get to faith in Jesus on our own. We need help. So that's the first thing we see. Secondly, we see their faith is active and not passive. They don't wait for a more convenient time. Uh, they don't wait for someone else to take their friend to Jesus. They act. And then we see that their faith looks very determined. Determined. We see a determined, desperate, and irrepressible faith. They believe Jesus can help their friend. And their faith in Jesus compels them to do whatever it takes. Creating a scene, they were willing. Uh, looking foolish, for sure, they were willing. Incurring the cost of damaged property, for sure. Anything to bring their friend to Jesus. Now, if you're following along and you're using your journal, you might want to write alongside this place in the text. What does my faith in Jesus compel me to do? What is my faith in Jesus? Is there anywhere that my faith in Jesus is compelling me to do what these four friends did with their friend? And notice, Jesus sees their faith. Verse 5, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. That leads us to the second problem in the story, the problem of sin. The problem of sin. When I was going through a seminary uh, years ago, I was required to complete a practical experience called clinical pastoral education. Um, when I had to go serve uh, as a uh, chaplain, and a volunteer chaplain in a hospital in, Chicago, in the greater Chicago area. And we would often uh, lead devotions together uh, and one of us would be assigned to lead those devotions. And when my turn came, um, I chose to uh, speak from a passage in 1 Timothy where Paul says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason that in me, the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. Now, I was the only seminarian in my whole group of eight or nine at the hospital who came, who was going to a theologically conservative seminary. And my point was simply to uh, remind this group that although we had each been called into ministry in some way, we were to always be mindful that we were still sinners in need of the magnificent grace of Christ even in our lives. That was my point. Paul referred to himself as the foremost of sinners. And when I finished, I waited for the feedback from the group because we always gave each other feedback. And I was expecting, you know, a relatively positive response. But that's not what happened. The response was negative. In fact, not only negative, it was angry. One woman who was a seminarian uh, was almost shaking with, with rage when she said, how dare you? How dare you insinuate that I'm a sinner? She said, I've given my life to help others. Now, I was tempted to say, uh, actually, I didn't insinuate. I came right out and said, you're a sinner, because so am I. But I didn't, I didn't say that. It wasn't the right time. And that was the first time it dawned on me how, how offensive and often polarizing the word sin has become in our culture. One writer I was reading recently said, the only sin today is to claim that there is such a thing called sin. No one wants to be told they're a sinner. But I've noticed, and maybe you have too, everyone likes to point out the sins of the other. We see this all the time. Verse 5, Jesus, uh, we see, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Right now you should be going, wait, what? In your journal you should write a big question mark. Like, really? This strikes us first as surprising. It's a surprising thing for Jesus to say. This man obviously is suffering from a serious physical condition. So why does Jesus forgive him? 
But we also have to see, this is not only surprising, this is a shocking moment in the story. In fact, I would say that this moment right here, this sentence that Jesus says, uh, is right just in the second chapter of Mark, is actually why Jesus ends up on the cross chapters later. And we're going to see this more in the next couple of weeks. I mean, this is not what the friends tore a, hole, tore a hole in the roof for, right? This is not what the paralyzed man is hoping to hear. But it is the first thing Jesus says to him. We have to ask why. Two reasons. First, Jesus knows something about this man, something that he does not know, something that even his friends do not know. Secondly, Jesus is claiming something about himself, something that no one else in the story yet knows. So what does he know about the paralyzed man? Jesus knows that this man's problem, this man's physical paralysis, as painful and debilitating as it is, is not his greatest problem. I want, you to, I want to let that sink in just for a minute. His physical problem is not the greatest problem he has. The truth is, we live in a culture here in North America, 21st century, that worships at the altar of physical health. We are one of the first societies in the history of the world to both expect and demand a pain-free existence as our right. I have a headache, I take Tylenol, I feel better. I have a toothache, I go to my dentist and get it fixed. I have arthritic hips, I get them replaced and I feel better. All that's good. But think for a moment about the content of most of the prayers that we pray. Most of the prayers that we hear others pray. Is it not relief from physical pain and suffering? Are not most of our prayers for physical healing? Now, physical health is a good thing. Praying for health and healing is a good thing. We're invited to do so. But notice here, Jesus is telling this paralyzed man, and his friends, and us today, that that is not the most important thing. I wonder sometimes if we really believe what Jesus is saying here. Joe, Pastor Joe Scavato and I were talking and preparing for this sermon, and Joe asked an interesting question. He said, if the story were to end right here with this line, Son, your sins are forgiven, would the story be complete? Would we be satisfied with that as the end of the story? It's a good question. Because the truth is, Jesus is actually saying, if this story is only about healing, physical healing, then the story would be incomplete. Let's consider a little bit different perspective. We hear a great deal in our culture today about social justice. And that's a good thing. It is. The Bible teaches that the God we worship and serve is a God of perfect justice, and he calls his people to his justice in the world. But while economic injustice does exist, that's not the main problem in the world. While racial injustice does exist, that's not the main problem in the world. While all kinds of isms exist in the world today, racism, sexism, ageism, you name it, on and on, those isms are not the main problem in the world. They're just symptoms of the main problem. The Bible teaches, and Jesus is teaching us here in this story, that the greatest problem in the world, the greatest problem in each and every one of us is sin. Sin. This is the first issue Jesus is getting at. And if we start with anything other than the depth of our sin, we do not understand either him, Jesus, or the gospel that he brought to us. I think we have, tend to have two problems when it comes to sin. First, even though we try to deny it, even though we try to blame it on society or blame it on the really bad people out there, uh, we know it exists. We know what it is. And we know that it lives in us. And our second problem is we don't know what to do about it. We don't know what to do about it. And Jesus is addressing both of these problems because he's claiming something about himself. And that leads us to thirdly, the problem of authority. The problem of authority. Back to my story uh, being pulled over for speeding in Georgia a long time ago. And I said I learned a few things about authority. Here's what I learned. I learned that the Georgia State Trooper had the authority to pull me over and give me a ticket. 
I learned that the sheriff in the local town had the authority to detain me and make me call my father. But I also learned that my dad had the authority and the resources to pay my debt in full. There may not be a greater and more contemporary issue than this one, the problem of authority. I think we see it around us every day, don't we? I would say it's the great issue of our current, current cultural moment. The question is, who has the authority? Better yet, which authority, what authority can we trust to tell us the truth? Who has the right to make us wear a mask, to make us get a vaccine? Who has the right to fill in the blank, make us drive 55? Who has the authority? And at least in part, this issue has to do with truth. Who can we trust? And as our culture has moved in the recent decades from a standard of truth and authority that's outside of ourselves, God, for example, his revealed word, government for another, we've actually relocated the source of truth and authority to within ourselves. How many times do we hear, be your own truth, follow your heart, speak your own truth? That's a problem, and that's a problem of authority. Verse 6, Mark chapter 2, we read, Now some of the scribes were sitting there. These were men who trusted the authority of God's law, who believed they had authority. And they were questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now I'll stop here. Are they wrong? Are they wrong? Well, yes and no. They're asking the right question, the question of authority. Who has the authority to forgive sins? They give the right answer, only God alone. But they don't yet know who Jesus is. And that's where they're wrong. And that leads us to the fourth problem in the story, the problem of Jesus. Verse 8, And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take your bed, and walk? Let me pause there for a second. I'm going to give you a chance to answer that question yourself. Which question is harder, your sins are forgiven, or rise, take up your bed, and walk? I'll wait. It's a good question, isn't it? Let's keep reading. But that you may know that the Son of Man... This is very significant. Has the authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Now, several things to notice here. First, Jesus knows what they are thinking. Now, this is just me, but I don't think this required sort of divine mind reading by Jesus. Uh, he knows that they're scribes. He knows their commitment to the law. Uh, they know, he knows that they know that the only one who has the authority to forgive sin is God himself. And then he refers to himself as son of man. Now, this is Jesus' favorite way of referring to himself uh, in the Gospels. He does so over 70 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why? Because the Son of Man was understood to be a messianic title of authority. It comes from the book of Daniel. Jesus is saying when he applies that phrase to himself, he's saying not only do I have the authority to teach and preach the gospel, not only do I have the authority to cast out unclean spirits, not only do I have the authority to heal the sick, I have the authority of God to forgive sin because I am God. In a very real sense, and we're going to see this over the next couple of weeks, Jesus is picking a fight. And he knows it because he knows what the response is going to be. But then he goes on to demonstrate that, a, that authority that he's just claimed by telling the paralyzed man to get up and walk. Now, here's what's important here. Jesus did not heal everyone in the, in the whole region when he was alive. Jesus didn't heal everyone. He didn't. He healed some. And the healings are never the point of the story. We tend to make them the point of the story. They're marvelous and they're miraculous, but the healings are not the point of the story. He didn't heal everyone, but he does offer forgiveness to everyone. 
He offers salvation to everyone. And that's the point of the story. I was a psychology major in college. But when I sensed God calling me into ministry, I figured I needed to go back to school to pick up uh, more education and, 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 and by biblical studies. So I enrolled at Taylor University to take a second undergrad degree in biblical studies. And one of my professors there was the late Dr. Sig Zilke. And on the very first day of class, I'll, I'll never forget it, uh, before he, he did anything, he took a piece of chalk and he wrote on the blackboard this sentence. Jesus is not the answer. Now you have to remember, the class was filled with Christian students, many of whom were heading into some sort of Christian ministry of some sort. And so when he wrote this on the board, at a time when it was commonplace to see a bumper sticker that said Jesus is the answer, it created kind of a weird moment in the classroom. An awkward sort of silence. So he waited a few long moments, and then he, he said, Jesus is always the question. Jesus is always the question. And then he went on to explain that until we know the questions, until we ask the right questions, we cannot know the answers. In this story, and throughout the Gospel of Mark, we're going to see Jesus presents us with questions. Questions like, who or what is our authority? In what or in who do you place your ultimate faith or trust? What is the Gospel? What is the good news of God? What is your greatest problem? Which is the greater miracle? The forgiveness of sin or the healing of a paralytic? My father is 88 years old. Some of you know he came to live with us this summer. Fell and broke his hip. He's struggling in many ways. And I pray for him. I would love to see him restored and strengthened. But here's the question. Do I believe the greater miracle has already happened in his life when he was 15 and he met Jesus. What do I believe is the greater miracle? Where do we invest our hope? In physical healing? That's a good thing. But where do we invest our hope? In physical healing or in spiritual new birth and the great hope of salvation? That's what this story is about. I hope you'll follow along with us through the Gospel of Mark. We're going to close this service today with uh, the remembrance of communion. Uh, so in just a moment, I'm going to pray. Then we're going to hear a song of worship. And so you might want to make ready your own elements of bread and cup so we can remember at that right time the Lord who alone has the authority to forgive sin. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you for this, thank you for this beautiful story of a determined and desperate faith these four nameless men who loved their friend and who had faith in Jesus. We ask you to grow in us that kind of faith. Today we recognize your authority, not only to heal, but to forgive. Remind us through bread and cup of the price you paid for our sin, for my sin. And by your spirit, fill our hearts with gratitude, joy, and newness of life. It's in your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We come now to a time that we call communion. It's a time we do remember the great mercy of the Lord Jesus for each one of us. We also believe here at Chapel Street that this table does not belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. So wherever you're watching this from today, from your home or somewhere else, we hope you'll join us in remembrance of the Lord's Supper. Scripture tells us that on the same night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples with these words. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the bread, scripture says he took the cup. He poured it and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sin. 
As followers of Jesus, we uh, remember what Paul said, and that is that each time we take this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. Do this in remembrance of him. Receive now today's benediction. May we go now in the name of Jesus, who holds all authority in heaven and on earth. May we worship and serve him as our King. Amen.